from Boston, or Cambridge, I guess, more appropriately. My guest this week is Matt Richtel, who is a New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning columnist, uh, among many other things, and an author of books in several different genres. And the one I'd like to talk about today is his brand new book called Inspired, Understanding Creativity, A Journey Through Art, Science, and the Soul. So let's talk a little bit about your journey to writing this book, because it's a little different than the things you've done before, and it's definitely different from your day job. Yep. Well, um, is this the part where I tell you the backstory? Yeah, 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 why not? Well, first of all, uh, hello, Rita, and thank you. Um, and um, and uh, it's a, it's a a double privilege because uh, Columbia was my journalism school. Fabulous. Fabulous. Um, Statue and, of Pulitzer right in front of the school. Yeah. If, if, if not, none of my classmates or teachers would have believed it. Um, <laughs> I do also want to express my gratitude for all the people listening in. Um, I love this topic. Um, and, um, and I, and it is so applicable to what you guys do and to what everybody does. And, and I suspect to, in particular, to the people who are on this um, zoom, this meeting today, because creativity is though is, is such a intense intersection of intellectual curiosity and openness and, some drive and the things that really make academia what it is um, and business ultimately what it is. And I spent a lot of time with business people, but to get to the backstory of this, I want to tell you guys a, a quick story about Charles Schultz, the creator of Peanuts that helps explain how I got here. Um, and maybe it will be, um, it will resonate with a few of you guys. So um Round about my 20s, I had a little bit of a, of a, I guess I'll call it a mental health collapse. I didn't know really what I was doing with my life. Um, uh, I could aggrandize it, Rita, but really it it was just my 20s. Everybody goes through it. When I came out the other side, I'd found a voice that I found really comfortable, that I was very comfortable with. And I started creating like a mad person. And one of the first things I did was a syndicated comic strip through a, a, a big syndication house called United Media. And my editor had been the Charles Schultz's editor at Peanuts or for Peanuts. And I asked her to tell me a Charles Schultz story. And this is what she cho- told me. She said that he would wake up in the morning and he would become thrilled by an idea, overcome by an idea. And he would say, and I'm using hand gestures here. I'm gesticulating. He'd say, this is it. I've got it. I've got the idea for the perfect comic strip. And for anybody out there who's had an idea for a business, a paper, a grant, you know that feeling, Rita? Do you know that feeling when you're overcome? And so Charles would go about writing. She called him Sparky. That was his nickname to those who knew him well. Sparky would go about writing and create a comic strip. And the next morning he'd wake up and he'd read what he'd done and he'd go, nah. I don't know. That's not it. Wait, I've got it. I've got the idea for the perfect comic strip and off he'd go again. I got interested in this topic because I experienced the euphoria, the overpowering feeling of inspiration. And I wanted to understand what it is scientifically, biologically, neurologically, This is not the traditional self-help book. This is a look at the science of inspiration and of its execution. And the book um, famously starts in Jerusalem um, with with a reference to uh, um, Herod being the Steve Jobs of his day (laughs) and a near-death experience in a taxi and a whole bunch of other things. And I love the way you um, talk about creativity as this path-dependent, cumulative you know, set of processes that, um, that it takes a multitude, right? And then, and then you talk about small Cs, big Cs, and then eventually something crystallizes, which is sort of 
something I've written about as well. Um, but something crystallizes and then a person comes to represent that that idea, that moment, that breakthrough. But there's a whole tumult of other breakthroughs that happen earlier than that. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting way of laying it out because we all, we all, you know, Steve Jobs arrives on a clamshell and the world changes forever, right? <laughs> and that's that's sort of our mental model for creativity, but that's not really how it happens. It's not at all how it happens. Um, I I started this in um, Jerusalem for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it, many consider it the you know a center place of creativity, but I was really struck when I was touring there, thinking about these issues, that the tour guide said Herod was the Steve Jobs of his time. And I started to think about this idea of creative genius. Um, And what I realized, um, among many other pieces of science, was there was a reason that Jerusalem was so fecund with, so filled with creativity. And it wasn't that Herod or any of the prophets um, or messiahs, and and here I I'm, I make no judgment. I'm just you know generally thinking of Jerusalem as a was really a company town, and the company the the company or the industry was religion at the year zero, uh, based on this particular calendar. But what's interesting about Jerusalem, Rita, is it had a population of five hundred thousand which was big for its day. And what the creativity research will show you is that there is a a deep relationship between population level and creativity. Mm. And the places we associate with creativity, Silicon Valley, New, New York, Harlem, Paris at periods, Russia at periods, you know, go down the list, were population centers. And, and it goes to the point that you were alluding to a moment ago, which is creativity is subject to a huge network effect. And when lots of people, and I don't think this is surprising to, the, to those listening, but it is also so that creativity is a product of a time-dependent network effect. And that for every Steve Jobs or Herod or you know, name the creator, Martin Luther King Jr. or Martin Luther. There was a progression of thought prior to that. And when the leader or quote unquote genius emerged, he or she did so on the backs of many, many ideas. And only when the environment was ready for that idea did its expression matter. Yeah, there's a very famous concept um, in, I guess it's in, in the persuasion field called the Overton window, yeah. uh, which, which you're probably familiar with. But the Overton window basically says, you know, you take a range of views on any topic at all, you know, but to, to say it's a policy topic, um, all the way from, you know, guns should be banned and never exist on the planet anymore, ever, even in military situations, all the way through to guns should be, you know, readily available in cereal boxes for young people. You know, that somewhere between those two really extreme positions is this position that the bulk of people find palatable. And I think a lot of times what happens with some of the creative people that you point out in the book is they happen to just be in that sweet spot of that Overton window at the moment it kind of opens. I want to throw some biology in. I wrote this book against the backdrop of COVID. Mm-hmm. And I want to, to the point about um, the relationship between idea environment and environment, I would like to point out that um, COVID presented a fascinating opportunity for me and insight because it is fairly a brilliant creation. Mm-hmm. And it tells us a lot about creativity. So, What is creativity? Well, creativity is something novel that has an impact. The impact can be very modest. Um, It need not be profound, pronounced, well-known. I will go so far as to say when you walk into the kitchen as a parent and you've got three ingredients in the fridge and hungry children, and you combine those ingredients in a way you were unfamiliar with or has never happened before, and suddenly honey mustard 
spicy, salty chicken happens and your kids eat it, you have created something. And that, that can go all the way up to the extreme end where a creation has a, is very profound and has immunotherapy. Uh, James Allison, who won the Nobel, is a character in, in my book, and he's doing a wonder to create cancer. Bono, whose music um, you know from U2, is a character. Um, there are billionaires in this book whose, whose technologies um, you know, made a major impact. Their work, like COVID, was a combination of a novel thought and the environment it fell into. And so let me use COVID as this example because it tells us something, a bunch of things about creativity. And among them, it tells us that creativity is neither good nor bad. Mm-hmm. And that is something vital to, to, to recognize in this conversation. It is not moral or amoral. Its impact is, is in fact highly unpredictable. So look, COVID, we call it the novel coronavirus. It is novel in a bunch of different ways, but the way I like to think about it, it was novel for our immune system. Mm -hmm. It was close enough to what came before to catch on among human beings, but different enough to flummox and, and, and create some challenges for our immune system. And it happened to come at a time when we could travel widely, when um, an, a global economy allowed movement, allowed the exchange of biological information. And so the novelty of its biology combined with the environment that it happened to set in on caused this thing to become a mass market hit, if you will. Oh, I, I'm not, I'm, I know that sounds funny, but it's really instructive as to the nuance. It was a very familiar virus to our bodies as a coronavirus, but it was very novel in that it challenged us in new ways. Mm -hmm. And it spread because of the nature of the modern world. That is the very definition of how a creation that might otherwise be small gets huge. And the facilitating, you know, the, 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 the infectiousness of it, the fact that it could travel around the world in a matter of hours. I mean, it was pretty incredible. All of that was incredible. And it is the example of a creation and an, and an indication of why a creation is neither good nor bad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the myths that you explore in the book, which I think is, super interesting is we've got this sort of pro-creativity bias, right? So if you say to people, do you think creativity is a good thing? And they all say, yeah, absolutely. It's like, it's like, you know, apple pie and whatever. Um, and it's like saying hope is not a good thing or, you know, human ingenuity is not a good thing. And yet when you look at science, um, creativity from an emotional point of view has gotten a lot of kind of mixed feedback. Some, um, of, the, some of the very best research in the field has been done by scholars at business schools. Mm -hmm. And this um, research that you're alluding to was was done. um, And and, and part of the reason for that is there's a market here and a market to understand a tension that happens in the business world around creativity. Mm -hmm. So my favorite study on this subject is done by a scholar named Jack Giancalo. And I think he is now at um, Champ- uh, Illinois, Champaign, Urbana, I believe, um, uh, may have I came, trained at a very well, highly regarded um, business school where he asked a question. He asked, well, we say we like creativity, do we? And he did a, 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 a test using implicit bias Um, research uh, techniques. You know implicit bias. This is where you say so-and-so of, uh, I I think all, I I feel equally about all races, but then you do an implicit bias test and discover that people have different fears, different um, 
uh, associations and so forth. He finds out that on the explicit level, people say, I love creativity, and they associate it with rainbows and puppy dogs and happiness. But on implicit bias tests, when you compare the control, people associate, what do you think they associate creativity with, Rita? Well, I know because I've read the book. <laughs> you read vomit and toxins and poison. Now, why in the heck, you've read the book, but do you have a, would you have had a guess as to why that is, Rita, before I tell you some of the reasons? Well, I do a lot of work on the innovation space and, okay. and we have a similar pro-innovation bias in our thinking, but just as with your work on creativity, you know, innovation can be destructive as well as, as productive. And, and you know, uh, years and years ago, uh, there was this theme about waves of creative destruction. And so innovations make things obsolete. Innovations yeah. can be dangerous. Innovations can, you know, suggest that and, all and is And I'll go even right. farther, Rita. Innovation is death. I oh, mean, wow. <laughs> you're, if you're a, if you are a gas powered car company right now, you are staring down a law in 2035 in California that says you can't sell your car there anymore, new, if it is gas powered. You know, th there's a million things to say of Elon Musk and the electric vehicle. Um, and again, I make no judgment, but if you're a coal worker, you look at it differently than if you're starting a battery factory. But there's another piece that explains why we associate creativity with poisons and toxins. And it's not just the potential for obsolescence, it's the potential for failure. Mm. And any creative risk, if it is truly creative, I think it was, it was Einstein who may have pointed this out, you can't know the outcome by definition. And so you are, it is inherently risky and it puts the creator and the people subject to the ultimate creation at enormous risk of either going down a road that won't work or worse yet, Rita, of going down a road that will work. If you'll excuse my enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have a, we face a real tension around creativity and the business world probably faces it as much as anybody, mm -hmm. um, and and I've I've heard it said and done work now in the New York Times on this, middle managers are in a pickle worse than just about anybody, mm -hmm. because they need to keep things going at a certain pace, and they're being asked to create something new that puts at risk their revenue stream. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So I'm working with a company right now that um, makes, it, it's related to the construction industry. And every middle manager in that space is being incented and rewarded on, did you make the quarter? Did you make the year? You know, they're not, they're not being asked to look five years out. And I'm saying things like, you know, energy friendly materials and thinking of homes as, you know, sort of nodes in a, in a grid and like all these things, right, that are going to definitely completely overwhelm the construction business. And these guys are like, yeah, yeah, I'll get to it. Because <laughs> how, because how can they not? They, you got to put food on the table tonight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, even if the menu's changing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it doesn't give you a lot of time to retrofit the kitchen. It doesn't. It and doesn't. I'm filled with worthless metaphors like that. <laughs> Is that your journalistic streak coming up? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's poor man's creativity. <laughs> So, um, so we've sort of got this, this struggle, right, around recognizing the creative idea. When is it? When is it good? How do we decide to do it? But you also talk about being overtaken by the idea. You know that, like, it is so compelling, so inspiring that you can't not do it. And I think that's an interesting tension as well. You know, because so I mean, maybe that's a good segue into the neuroscience here. Yeah. I, yeah. Is that okay? So. A, I, I tried to look at the neuroscience. I did look at the neuroscience. And there, broadly speaking, there are two parts of the brain involved in creativity. There is a subconscious or unconscious part. 
um, that very broadly is known as the default network, although the, actually regions of the brain are very hard to track. And then there's an executive control function, which is, we know better, it's the prefrontal cortex. It's the stuff that happens up here. It's the stuff that makes us most human. But a process will essentially work in the way I'm about to describe is that an idea will bubble up from the subconscious, the unconscious. It is very often not directed. And you'll hear lots of stories in the book from all kinds of interesting people, Gary Trudeau um, and, 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 and others who speak about how this process works and Judd Apatow. Um, and, and in fact, I'll tell you one about a business person in a moment. And after those ideas bubble up, they bubble up without judgment. And this is very vital for anybody who wants to facilitate their own creativity. Those ideas must filter out without judgment. I'll explain a little bit more about that happens. But the other region of the brain then starts to run those ideas over kind of a rigorous and analytical construct. The, the, the analytical terrain of your brain takes these random thoughts and starts to basically run, do a computation. Does it make sense? Will this work? And inspiration looks to be those moments when something is bubbled up and then been run over the terrain and meet those initial expectations of this makes enough sense to pursue. Now, I'm going to argue, although this part is more speculation, Rita, for those who have experienced the euphoria of inspiration, have you've had that, right? We talked about that a little earlier. Mm -hmm. And can you just explain what that feels like, how, how powerful that is for you? Because I want to get to why that might be. Mm -hmm. Can you just articulate that for people? Yeah, so one one moment um and it, it gets to writing books right which we've talked about is a book to me my like my books they have to come together around a theme and so i was noodling on this idea of strategic inflection points which was what my latest book was about you know since andy grove wrote about it in the 1990s but like i didn't know what to do with it like, you know, like grove was writing about okay the inflection point is here it's happened it's come here's how i'm responding to it as a leader and i really wanted to write about well you know how could you maybe you know, prepare, better prepare for an inflection point. And what finally brought the book together in my mind was when a friend sent me an article and the article was called, what if you changed the world and nobody noticed? And I think this is very related to the theme of your book. And what this article described was the discovery of manned flight. And, you know, the Wright brothers, you know, North Carolina flying around. And what they described was that they, they looked at the newspaper the day after, nothing. The month after, nothing. Six months after, nothing. Four years. Wonderful example. After, nothing, right? And yeah. so what, what fascinates me too is there were literally people in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, staring up at the sky. The Wright brothers are flying around and these people were dismissing it. They were saying, it's an optical illusion. It's a circus trick. I'm not going to allow myself to believe that because the paradigm at the time was so settled on not seeing. It. And so that's what led me to the actual aha about the book, which was um, Hemingway's old line, uh, From the Sun Also Rises. When one character asks another, how did you go bankrupt? And the answer was, well, two ways, gradually, and then suddenly. Okay. <laughs> and that so, I really realized, and that the aha, the emotional aha was, I could write a book about that. Because if it takes such a long time to actually materialize. I have a question for you. Yeah. Did you say, I can write a book or I need to write a book? Mm. I probably needed to write that book. Okay. Yeah. This is my working hypothesis based uh -huh. on the neuroscience that I've outlined in this book mm -hmm. is that we have been gifted through evolution with this feeling of inspiration that is so powerful that it overcomes the, um, the urge to do nothing. Mm -hmm. The urge to do nothing is, should be very powerful because it is resource intensive to take a risk. It is not necessarily in your primal best interest to invest two years or a year or nine months in creating something from whole cloth that someone may not read 
or that may float around in the sky and people may not notice. Mm -hmm. And so what evolution has done in the course of inspiration is push us through the inertia of doing nothing. It is much easier to do nothing and very hard and very risky to do something. Mm -hmm. And so that feeling of I must, for me, it's I must write a song, I must write a book, I must write an article, I must. It's not I should, it's nothing can stop me right now. Mm -hmm. My wife has an adage in our house, no creative projects until the dishes are done. Because <laughs> she knows that I may go for it. And I think that feeling that Charles Schultz experienced that Sparky did with the peanuts and that some of us get to a greater or lesser extent is a way that evolution pushes us through standing still. Mm, that's fascinating. And you make the point that, that creativity um, is... Uh, uh, it, you, you, it's, a, it's a leap, right? You can't help yourself. It's a, yes. a leap kind of forward. And then, um, you know, one of the themes in the book that I found was interesting was that a lot of people talk themselves out of thinking that they can be creative. They don't, they right. don't allow that part of themselves to express themselves. And yet you make the argument that, 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 that we all have that. We all have this, I think you call it the spice rack theory of creativity. We all have the ingredients with which to create something new. And yet many of us don't allow, allow ourselves to do that. Um, first of all, there's a question here from a gentleman named Frank, and I want to mm -hmm. honor it. Oh, hi, Frank. Um, um, is a, is a, and, and I'll, I'll use it as a segue um, to, um, to talk a little bit more about but the, the answer is either Frank asked this question is a creator is a create a person more creative with themselves or with others alone or with others. And um, the answer is both, but I want to tell you a story about Judd Apatow. Um, um, the, you know, the comedic director, for those who don't know, he's in Hollywood. He's one of our luminaries in, in creative, in, in, sorry, in comedy um, in Hollywood. And he told me this story about the writer's room, two different writer's rooms of two big shows. One was the Larry Sanders show at the risk of dating myself. That was on HBO back in the stone ages. And, um, and one was a more recent show called um, something, uh, it, it's irrelevant. Here's what happened at the Larry Sanders show. At the Larry Sanders show, the the, the comedic writers would be in a room and their job was to come up with ideas for the show and they would throw ideas out. And then the head writer would, so they were like the unconscious. Remember I talked earlier mm -hmm. about the back mm -hmm. of the brain, throwing ideas out, trying to be as, as non-judgmental as possible. And then the head writer would act as the prefrontal cortex and start running those ideas over the rugged analytical terrain would they work. And what happened was a problem. And the problem was that they were so worried that Gary Shandling had a particular way of seeing things that they got nervous throwing ideas out mm -hmm. and they wouldn't do such a good job. And the show began to get a little stale and it, the writers got frightened. The collective unconscious didn't work as openly as it might have. Mm. Now, by contrast, a more recent show that Judd was a part of, um, um, it's a show about a comedian who sleeps on a bunch of couches in New York. It's been a, it's been kind of a cult hit. And the head writer of that was the star of the show. And he would come in and lay himself bare, Rita. He would like get up there and tell the most humiliating stories about himself, like just, just prostrate himself in front of the writer's room and they got very open and the process worked very well because the unconscious was allowed to flow. Mm -hmm. That's an environment, Frank, where collectively, if permission is given that you can be very creative, that's a big if. It's also a big if for the individual, Frank, because, and this goes to the question of why we don't allow ourselves to create. I'm gonna use some science from our youth, if you'll permit. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to say to Frank, who I can't see, thank you for being letting me be long-winded. I am trying to take us somewhere. There's something <laughs> called the fourth grade slump in creativity. Mm. And the fourth grade slump in, in the late 50s and early 60s of the last century, pioneering researchers looked at when what happened to creativity among children and found that people had less creative fluidity after fourth grade. And they were like, what the heck's going on? What happens after that period is we start to internalize a lot of rule systems. They make sense. The first thing parents teach kids is no. Don't run across the street. Don't pick your nose and eat it. Don't put that in your mouth. Don't eat that off the floor. Don't lick the dog. <laughs> we're doing that for good reason because we're trying to stay alive. But what happens to individuals is that they begin to say no to themselves before they say yes. So an individual, Frank, faces the same challenge as that writer's room. Will he or she or they give themselves enough permission to let the unconscious, let the ideas go enough to get to the level of the conscious? And I'm going to look again in the chat to just make sure that. We've got a lot of questions now. Okay, um, can, can you tell me one so I... Sure. Um, so the show is called Crashing, one of our... Crashing, thank you. There you go. Uh, so, thank you, MD. Um, Michael would like to know, Michael. there's a lot of debate in advertising and marketing about how creativity and technology or data can complement each other. And there's yes. a fear that the data folks are killing the traditional big ideas approach to advertising. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do have, I do have thoughts. I mean, I think, I think that... that um, I'm, I'm going to tell this story through um, some more science. Probably my favorite um, bit of science in the entire book, and I hope me giving this all away will not preclude you from supporting these ideas and your local <laughs> writer. I buy a copy. But this is my favorite, some of my favorite science. I think it's uh, scholars at the University of California at Santa Barbara looked at an amazing idea. They looked at what creators actually see, physically see, and they made a profound discovery. Here's what this research was. They, they tested people's creativity levels based on a bunch of standard measures, and then they ranked their study participants based on their creativity level. Then they sat all these folks at various levels of creativity, in front of a computer screen and put eye tracking software on them, very sophisticated, and had them look at the screen to see what they picked up, what they stared at and for how long. And lo and behold, and Michael, I'm going to answer your question. I promise you. Lo and behold, the people who were more creative saw more things, looked at more areas, and spent more time looking at those areas. Hmm. Here's the implication. People who are creative are less rigid and able to open up their minds to seeing more information. This argues for the use of data and inputs as a way to seed information, but it argues against letting the data limit your worldview such that you accept certain premises as essential or that you must meet. And that's the distinction I draw here. Inputs are great. Inputs that dictate a rigid view are anathema to creativity. And that's two truths that we must hold at the same time. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that great question, Michael. And I hope I answered it because I owed you for crashing. <laughs> <laughs> so Kathy wants to know, uh, are there things that can help turn off your inner judge so you don't kill good ideas before they get the space to grow? Yes. Um, I, I want to tell you guys an example, because I think that I think in all this wonky talk that I sometimes do, I don't really get to what I mean by letting your brain open up. And I'm going to give you guys a, a very personal example. Um, and I'm going to ask Rita an uncomfortable question. Oh, dear. Rita, this is my question. Mm -hmm. 
before you go to sleep, yeah. and, and this is by way of giving people an example of what I mean by unfettered, um, allowing yourself unfettered inspiration. And I can tell you guys this because I, I, I live this stuff. This is what I've been given for better or worse is a flow of ideas that I have given myself permission to observe for good or ill. And, and before I get to the exercise, let me explain what I mean for good or ill. You know, the book Lolita by Nabokov, mm -hmm. that book is about a, a man having relations with a young girl. Okay, that is a heretical notion. That book is considered one of the best pieces of literature of all time. Somehow Nabokov allowed himself to hear an idea that was by many measures obscene and create something beautiful of it. So I want to, that's the level of lack of judgment I'm talking about. So here's my question for you, Rita, and I'm not talking about anything prurient. Before you go to bed at night, can you tell us where your mind wanders? Is there anything you fantasize about? Uh, having a lot of money. Uh, what do you do in those moments before bed? Um, well, for me, I'm a very curious person and I do a lot of reading and a lot of um, kind of reflecting on what I've read. So it sounds almost boring, but like my mind tends to wander on whatever the latest thing was that I read. So your book got to be on my bedstand for a few okay. days. Um, so it's something like that. What I would say though is if I separate it out from right before bed, but I think about when when I get creative ideas and in the book, you talk about your mind wandering and something nice about my job is I actually get paid to think and reflect and do so you stuff. do that all the time. Well, let me, the re I'm glad you use the phrase mind wandering because mm -hmm. this is what I want to express to everyone listening. Mind wandering is a deeply non-judgmental mm -hmm. activity. And the reason I bring up before bed is it's a very disarmed time for people. And I'm going to give you two examples of things that used to run through my mind before I went to bed. I had no idea why. When I was a kid, I would regularly go to bed and imagine that I was in a cabin in an isolated area and I had a rifle and I was trying to defend my little area from foes. Now I lay myself bare here and explain this mind wandering thing to let you know that as much as that sounds like nothing, that is also how books start. What happens next is you follow that idea to what you can make a story of that thing. But I never thought of myself as writing anything. I never thought of that as creative. That was just my mind wandering. Later on, I'm very happily married to my wonderful wife with my wonderful two kids. But in my 20s or at some point, I remember letting my mind wander to meeting the woman in the bookstore. And it was an act of such lack of judgment to my ideas. That's the level at which mind wandering has to happen. It has to happen where you are so disarmed that you are not directing your thoughts. Uh, is this a reinforcement of reading? Is there a goof mind wandering and a bad mind wandering? I don't, I don't think, um, I don't think there's a bad mind wandering. In fact, that's expressly the point here. And it's why I brought up Nabokov. And listen, um, there's a great, uh, there's a great story I heard about Einstein from one of the scholars who studies, um, who, who, who studies the, the quote unquote great creators. And he goes to, you know, he's looking for the unified field theory and he goes to this colleague and he says, oh, oh my God, I've got it. I've got the unified field theory. Although he probably didn't, that, this is probably more where his hair was, not his hand. And his, his, his colleague says, uh, well, Albert, uh, that, that's wonderful. But under that theory, the universe cannot exist. And 
you know, the thing about bad mind wandering is it's indistinguishable from good mind wandering and it's indistinguishable from moral and amoral. Bob Dylan, I write, uh, I write in the book says, uh, I don't know left or right. He'd been invited to speak to an early version of the NAACP or uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the um, ACLU. Mm -hmm. like a precursor. And they thought he was going to say something really political. He says, I don't know about left or right. So there is no good or bad. Um, let's see, who can can you help me with a question here? Sure. So um, Marianne wants to know, or Marianne wants to know, how do you go from an idea born out of creativity to actual innovation, something that nobody else did? Yeah. Um, so look, this is where there's no there's, there's no substitute for two things. One is the actual test of how potent the inspiration is in you. And what I mean by that, and sorry, who asked the question? So I can. Uh, it was Manuel, I think. Hold on, let me look. It's Manuel, or, or I just want to direct this appropriately to whomever asked the question. You know, one of the, one of the ways, um, Manuela, Mm -hmm. Hi, Manuela. So. One of the one of the ways to that this happens. Well, broadly speaking, this happens through immense hard work, and I'm going to tell you a story about an entrepreneur in a second. But it, but it happens in part by pressure testing how inspiring the idea is through the beginning of its execution. And what winds up happening as you start working through the execution of this thing is you determine by how hard you work, whether that inspiration was potent enough to keep you going. And let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, and and if, Manuel, if I'm not answering your question, please, please come at me again. But it so happens that um, in San Francisco, my son, uh, we're now in Colorado for a year, but, but prior to this in San Francisco, my son had a classmate whose father had... Um, in the say early uh, early mid two thousands, um, had one of these aha moments, these unconscious moments. He was going to get married, and he thought he was too heavy, and he went to twenty uh, four hour fitness, and they gave him a calorie counter on a piece of paper and said count your calories, and he was a techie, and he says. Uh, there's got to be a better way. I'm not going to write this down every day on a piece of paper. And this was pre-apps. These were the early web days. And he's got a day job. And he's like, I can count my calories digitally. I know I can do this. And to Manuela's question, he starts to execute and build this calorie counter. And every year he's building it more. And every year He's, this inspiration is gnawing at him and he puts it on the web and then he gets some reinforcement and a bunch of people are saying, hey, I lost weight, Michael. And then he, VCs start showing up. Long story short, he and his brother sell this to Under Armour along with their VCs for $500 million. Whoa. And this was a 10 year journey not to make money, mm -hmm. but driven by the power of that idea um, and and it happened to work out. And you know what's so interesting as, as a coda to this? I spent a lot of time now with Mike chatting about he craves having an inspiration that strong again. He hmm. doesn't care about the money. He wants to feel that feeling again. And hmm. it happened through the hard work driven by the wind of inspiration in his sales. Okay. Hmm. Love that. Uh, so there's, there's a story about an architect who works first with the younger people and then brings the more um, traditionally trained people in later on. So doesn't let that traditional training influence. It's Marianne has raised that to us. Um, I, um, there's a, just a nice note here from N N Naveen or Navin, if I'm saying your name correctly. He's chosen tolerance. And I think that is when it comes to mind wandering. Um, and I'll give you another way of thinking about that tolerance through some science. 
-hmm. It's a very, very vital word. Um, and we are, we are programmed in some ways to be intolerant for the reasons I talked about as kids. It's a resource save. Toler intolerance is a resource saving device. In fact, I make the point in the book that prejudice, wherever you see it, is not actually malice. It's a resource saving technique to try to ge generalize about a person, a group of people, a set of circumstances. So you save yourself the effort that you could direct at something else. If you really look at it scientifically, it's not malice. It's a very self-defeating resource saving device because the human condition is too varied to generalize for the most part. But it would be nice if you could write off somebody or something right away without thinking about it because you're saving time. That's where that comes from. Tolerance is really good. Here's the study that will help that that really helped me understand it. There's a woman named Emma Sapala who studies creativity mm -hmm. and some other things at a whole bunch of I don't know how she's affiliated with so many Ivy League universities. Um, I'm actually not allowed on multiple of the campuses. <laughs> she, she and I both belong to a writer's group where we, okay. we talk about these kinds of things it's called the Silicon Guild. Okay, the Silicon. So she's everywhere and she's mm -hmm. fantastic. And Emma was working with folks coming back from Iran and Afghanistan who had PTSD. Mm. And she was having them do breathing techniques, mind, my, um, uh, mindfulness techniques. Mm -hmm. And these are folks who had grown intolerant to very basic things like the mm -hmm. sound of a car, of a door closing, because it reminded them of a bomb going off. And little by little, her research and others, and this is not so novel, but it would find that what would happen when you did mindfulness techniques is they found some pause between the sound of the car alarm going off and the impulse to dive under the table from fear that that might be a bomb. And I think that what, what, this, what you'll see in my book through the science you'll see in my book is you can draw a dotted line between the mindfulness techniques and the tolerance that allows more mind wandering. And it lets you interrupt that moment of judgment. And in my case now, I don't even do, I, I barely even get to the judgment. Sometimes I see it. I'll be like, wow, you just had a really immoral thought or a thought you're not supposed to have or whatever it is. And I'll actually let that judgment pass and, and even see it as a propellant to let myself go have those thoughts and let those ideas into my field of seeds from which creativity may grow. That's very cool. That's very cool. So Frank wants to know um, what, to what extent does social media and live chat like this one help us to develop ideas and creative thinking? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, social media cuts absolutely cuts both ways. I, I will argue that we are in the most creative time in human history. And the reason for that uh, on, the, on the high level, Frank, and this is not about social media per se, but it's about the technological era we live in. I started this conversation by saying there were population centers that became very potent for creativity. You can argue the world is one giant population center right now. And if you want an idea from Bangladesh to, you know, you know, I don't know why I can't remember any other names of any other places right now. But, Chile, but this, Chile. the number of patents um, has exploded from cross from international collaborators. And that speaks to the value of the technology. Where 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 it becomes a problem is when you have misinformation or noise. Mm -hmm it causes inputs to become inauthentic. Mm -hmm. And when inputs are in, when, when we're talking about the mind wandering and the tolerance that I think, um, and I, I, I forgot his name, N Naval or Navad mentioned, mm -hmm. those, one, one, another way to use that language, Rita, is to use the word authenticity. Mm -hmm. Those are authentic ideas bubbling up rather than ideas that we've prescribed from the beginning. And similarly, when you have misinformation in the world, 
you're getting inauthentic inputs that make it very hard to have true emotionally resonant um, responses or, or um, materials from which to borrow. Finally, Frank, I would add that when you get in a world where you feel you must conform and social media can do that, it inhibits your ability to be tolerant of other ideas. Broadly though, I'm pretty darn happy with the idea of a, of a society that democratizes the ability to share information, to get information and to share it. I think that is all gonna be huge for creativity. And I think we're gonna work our way out of many of these challenges. So one of the things you say in the book, uh, as we sort of get toward the end of our conversation together, but you talk about uh, don't give up your day job. And you use a couple of examples of people who you've argued are incredibly creative, incredibly authentic. There's a singer, for example, that you mentioned. Um, but that that to, li to, to live on an unending flow of creative ideas is hard. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. really and hard. I'm going to answer that. But Frank just put in a question so I make sure I answer his question okay. he asked. Does that mean you should shut off the noise? The answer is full stop, yes. You've got to give yourself space away from other people's sounds. And it doesn't mean you can't take in that information, but you must have periods where you get away from it. To, to go to the day job thing, look, creativity is not the same as wealth or fame. When I started this book, I was shooting baskets in front of my house with my son and I said, I think Rita, you knows this story. And I, and, and I said, Hey, I, I may interview Bono for this book. And my son says, Bono, he's, you know, he was 12 or 11 at the time. He goes, is that a him or a her? He wasn't making a comment on gender. He was making a comment on the fact that Bono is no longer a part of the public consciousness. And that if you associate creativity with fame or fortune, you've missed what creativity is. And so I, I would say to people to give yourself the most creative latitude, don't worry about it being your, you know, your, your um, source of income. My creative world keeps changing. I'm doing, I've done children's books. I've done fiction. I've done nonfiction. I write a ton of music right now. The way I give myself permission to do music is knowing that when I go to open mic night or a small gig, I get zero dollars and it doesn't matter because I'm still paying the bills doing this other stuff. Mm -hmm. Make room for that in your life. Yeah, I was thinking of that yesterday morning, in fact. So here I am in Boston. I'm away from home and I took a ride and the young woman that picked me up, um, this is about, let's say it was eight in the morning. She said, oh, you're probably going to be my last ride of the day and I said oh really you know because it was the beginning of the day and she said yeah so she's um she's an artist and she's in graduate school and so she gets up at 5 30 in the morning and drives for one of the ride sharing services uh, until nine and she said nine is her absolute cutoff and that's paid the bills and now she's going to go on with the, the 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 study and the art and the creative process that gives her life a lot of meaning and I thought that was such an interesting you know, okay, by 9, 9 a.m., I know I paid my bills for that day. I thought that was fascinating. Rita, speaking of 9 a.m., I know we're nearing our end, so it's a perfect segue to this, this conclusion. The research shows that people who indulge in this creativity are happier. It is its own end. Mm -hmm. And um, it's more of that reasons for that are in the book, but I would say to people that, Creativity it's, is its own lifestyle choice, and it's worth pursuing for that alone. <laughs> That's brilliant. That is absolutely brilliant. So um, how do people learn more? I mean, you've got you, you, you have your day job as this <laughs> heavy duty journalist, um, but all these other creative things too. So what's the best place for people to kind of keep up with your work, follow you, learn more? Well, I'm, I'm personally terrible at social media because I'm usually doing something else, but um, mattrichtel.com has lots of stuff. Um, and I am comfortable if you guys want to reach out to Rita, if you want to get in contact sure. with me for some reason, Great. by all means. Um, I am, uh, I'm currently writing uh, a series of stories for the New York Times on um, adolescent mental health called The Inner Pandemic. Oh, wow. Uh, that's a big project and a book will come out of that. Um, 
And I just want to finally end with my gratitude. Um, you know, it's it's just remarkable that anybody, I, I, I'm well aware that my wife does not want to hear me talk anymore. So if anybody <laughs> wants to listen to me in any way, shape or form, please accept my gratitude. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, thank you so much for joining. Um, have a great weekend, everybody. And we will see you in a couple of weeks on our next Fireside Chat. <laughs> Thanks. Rita, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.